<clears throat> okay, so um, as I say, welcome everyone to uh, to pediatric teaching today. And uh, for the first two weeks of this year, we've talked about a couple of general issues, haven't we? We talked about pediatric training in general and how to um, uh, how to organise your year and how to learn pediatrics. And the second thing we talked about the, the deteriorating patient. So last week we talked about the deteriorating patient, which encompasses a lot of uh, almost every diagnosis, every condition you can imagine. Um, and it's uh, something we commonly see every day, a uh, patient who's deteriorating. And to, uh, this week we wanted to talk about a, um, a particular uh, disease or condition. And the most common uh, and important pneumonia and other acute lower respiratory infections. Uh, in all countries throughout the world, pneumonia and acute lower respiratory tract infections are the commonest reason why children present to hospitals. They're the commonest reason why uh, children present to uh, uh, primary health care. And they're also one of the commonest reasons why children die. So I wanted to talk, I know you, you know a lot about pneumonia and bronchiolitis. Uh, and so I wanted to talk about some simple things to start with, but also then get on to some more um, complicated aspects of pneumonia treatment. So we'll just talk through both simple and complicated pneumonia and bronchiolitis particularly. So we'll talk about the, the causes of pneumonia and uh, it's important that we understand the causes because they are changing. The causes are changing. The causes of pneumonia that used to be there like 30 years ago are a bit different to what they are now. So, so there's been some changes. We'll talk about the clinical signs that I think you're all familiar with, but in a bit more detail. And part of the discussion of the clinical signs will be to, to try to identify high-risk children. We talked a bit about this last week, that one of our tasks as pediatric doctors, pediatricians, or nurses, pediatric nurses, is to try to identify the highest risk children. So the children most likely to deteriorate, the children most likely to um, have a prolonged course in hospital or the children most likely to die. And certainly the children who need hospital admission compared with being able to be discharged home. And so that's a skill that you have to learn, risk assessment. And uh, I hope by practice and by these, uh, these talks, you'll be able to do that. We'll, we'll talk a bit about treatment of pneumonia and also about complications because there are for the children who are the sickest with pneumonia, they don't generally have just a simple pneumonia. They often have a quite a complicated pneumonia, and I'll explain the different types of complicated pneumonia as we go along. So in terms of etiology, in terms of the causes of pneumonia, this is important to have some idea of the causes of pneumonia and that there's been many, many studies looking at the causes of pneumonia in Papua New Guinea and many other countries in the last uh, 40 years. And when you, when you go through those studies, this is the, the breakdown of the causes of pneumonia. And as I said, it has been evolving. There are new causes of pneumonia or causes that really weren't as prominent 30 or 40 years ago as what they are now. But this is quite current. This is what the situation is at the moment. Still about 20% of all pneumonia is due to the pneumococcus, like streptococcus pneumonia, pneumonia. Streptococcus pneumonia, the most common bacteria causing pneumonia. A bit less than that, some 15 to 20% are due to Haemophilus uh, influenzae and different types, there's type B and there's other types of Haemophilus influenzae, but about 15 to 20% are due to that. So that means that 40% of pneumonias are due to the commonest bacteria, the commonest two bacteria. It used to be more. It used to be a lot more, a higher proportion of pneumonias were due to these two common bacteria. But now that we've got the conjugate pneumococcal vaccine, PCV, and we've got the Hib vaccine, the Haemophilus influenzae type B vaccine, those, those, the proportion of pneumonias that are due to those bacteria are quite less, uh, somewhat less, and that means the proportion of pneumonias that are due to other pathogens, other viruses or bacteria are a bit more common. The, the other bacteria that sometimes cause pneumonia are Staph aureus. You, you've probably seen Staph pneumonia, and we'll talk a bit about that when we talk about complicated pneumonia. Sometimes other types of streptococcus, so group A streptococcus, 
and other forms of bacteria. And then of all this, of all the children who come in with acute pneumonia, like they look like they've got pneumonia, about five to ten percent of them have actually got TB. Now we used to we get used to thinking that TB is a chronic cough. It goes for you know two or three weeks or fevers for two or three weeks, and then the child presents. But there is about five or ten percent of all children who present with pneumonia with on their x-ray they've got consolidation they, they actually have TB so don't forget TB is a cause of as a as an important cause of pneumonia now in terms of viruses in terms of viruses there are some viruses are becoming more and the most common virus the most common virus is respiratory syncytial virus called RSV and that in in country recently I guess in the last um I'll just ask a few people to mute their thank you um in in the last 10 years there's been lots of studies done looking at the causes of pneumonia and in almost all countries about a third of pneumonia cases so yeah 30 to 35 percent about a third are due to RSV, respiratory syncytial virus. And of course, that's the commonest cause of bronchiolitis, isn't it? More than half of all the cases of bronchiolitis are due to RSV, but it's also a cause of pneumonia or what we, what we classify as pneumonia. There's some other viruses that are quite common too. So influenza A and B and parainfluenza and adenovirus, this last year in 2022, there was a lot of those viruses, RSV, influenza, paraflu, and adenovirus in all countries, especially in, in this region, in the uh, uh, Pacific region, there's been a lot of those other viruses. And often after those viruses, children would also get a bacterial infection. So just because a child's got a virus doesn't mean they don't also have a secondary bacterial infection. We'll talk a bit about that, about the causes. Then there's some other less common causes. Of course, COVID is a cause of pneumonia in children. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 has been a cause of pneumonia, but it's not causing very much pneumonia at the moment. I think it's more common to have pneumonia from these other viruses or other bacteria, but it certainly has been in the last three years a cause of pneumonia in children, but we don't know what percentage. It's something less than 5% for sure. Then, in the, then there's some other causes so in older children, particularly like school age children, mycoplasma pneumoniae is a relatively common cause. So it's good to think about there. In young infants at the other end of the age spectrum, in young infants, like under three months of age, then chlamydia is a relatively common cause. And the studies that were done in Groca in the 80s and 90s showed that chlamydia trachomatis was quite a common cause of pneumonia in young infants, maybe not the only cause, maybe the, in, in many children there were more than one cause, but chlamydia was quite commonly isolated. And then of course in, in children who have HIV, then pneumocystis durevecchi is a, is a relatively common cause, a PJP or PCP, what we have used to call PCP, are relatively common causes. So I've tried in this slide to just describe all the common causes of pneumonia and the relative percentages that um, if you add them all up, it comes to roughly 100%. And it's, it's the best estimate of what currently occurs. As I said, it's changed over time, but it's the best estimate of what we are currently seeing. The, the, the situation in terms of the causes of pneumonia, it's a bit more complex because it's often not just one pathogen. Usually, when children get pneumonia, they, they have a virus and then the virus causes inflammation of their nasopharynx and their upper airway. And of course, you produce more mucus, more secretions. And uh, sometimes, especially in young infants, they're likely to aspirate some of their nasopharyngeal secretions, especially when they're asleep or they're um, even when they're feeding, they might aspirate some of their nasopharyngeal secretions. Or if they've got severe um, uh, increased work of breathing, they've got severe respiratory distress, then they're likely to aspirate some of their nasopharyngeal secretions. And those secretions, that mucus often contains bacteria because many children in PNG and, and in the Pacific have are colonized with pneumococcus or haemophilus up their nose, and that gets aspirated into their lungs. And from that, they may get a secondary bacterial infection. Now, 
most recover fully with, anti with, with antibiotics and some don't even need them because they don't have a secondary bacterial infection. But there are certain children that um, get recurrent um, pneumonia. So because they're recurrently aspirating uh, their upper airway secretions, and usually this occurs in children that have like multiple virus infections in one season. So it's, it's not uncommon that you see a child who's got recurrent pneumonia and there'll be children I'm sure you've looked after in your hospitals that come back and back with recurrent pneumonia. And many of these children are those ones that have got a secondary bacterial infection um, and they may have what sometimes is called chronic wet cough or chronic bronchitis. And that is they every time they get a virus infection, they get a flare up of their bacterial infection too. And that's why the, many children with a virus like RSV or influenza or adenovirus, they, they may still respond to antibiotics. Now, of course, you know that viruses don't respond to antibiotics, but the reason why we see many children who look like they've got bronchiolitis respond to antibiotics is because they have not just a virus. They have a virus and they may have a secondary bacterial infection. On the other hand, there are children who just have viruses and we should do as much as we can not to treat them with antibiotics. But it's a little bit harder when, you, um, when you've got a child who's got um, a severe respiratory distress. Of course, they need antibiotics because even though they've got a virus, they might have a secondary bacterial infection as well. But that's the mechanism by which children can get get pneumonia. Usually they have a virus, then they get drip aspiration of uh, nasopharyngeal secretions. There are other ways. Sometimes the bacteria can circulate in the blood and get to the lungs. That's much, much less common. And it's more common to be aspiration type pneumonia. The classification of pneumonia is will be familiar to you. And I don't, I won't go into it. It's in the standard treatment book, but you know that there is what we call severe pneumonia. And the, the, the criteria are cough and difficult breathing with any danger signs or emergency signs or hypoxemia or oxygen Z saturation or cyanosis. And, and those children have the, the highest risk pneumonia, severe pneumonia. Then there's moderate pneumonia. So they've got cough and difficult breathing, but chest in, they've got chest in drawing, but no danger signs and they're not hypoxic. And then there's mild pneumonia, which is just fast breathing with no chest in drawing and no danger signs and no hypoxemia. And so it's useful to classify children in that, in that way because the treatment is different. Those with severe pneumonia all need to be admitted. Those with moderate pneumonia, many of them can be managed as outpatients if they, um, if they are, uh, are low risk children and if their parents understand how to give home treatment. And of course, those with mild pneumonia, they can all be managed, almost all be managed as, as outpatients um, just with oral amoxicillin or even sometimes with no antibiotics they, because they might just have a, a viral bronchiolitis. It's quite hard sometimes to detect the most severely ill children and quite hard to detect when children have hypoxemia hypoxemia being low oxygen saturations. And as you know, the normal oxygen saturation is usually more than 96%. But when children have pneumonia, they often have oxygen saturations less than 90%. But it can be quite hard to recognize them. And uh, this was a child that I saw on a ward round. And everybody had just passed the baby by and thought that he didn't look too bad. Um, and then we put an oximeter on him and you can see that the oxygen saturation is only 66%. And when you really look at him closely, you can see he's got severe chest in drawing, he's got marked chest in drawing, and he looks a bit cyanosed or dusky, but it is sometimes quite hard to see, especially in a dark hospital ward, isn't it? It's hard to detect these signs. And that's why checking the child's oxygen saturation is very important um, when we are doing triage and when we are making some assessment of the severity of pneumonia, whether it's severe or moderate or mild. This is the child who's got pneumonia. And I think you can see the clinical signs that indicate that he has severe pneumonia. You can see he's got hyperinflation. 
He's got severe chest in drawing, intercostal recession, subcostal recession. He's got nasal flaring. And he went from in the earlier video to being being quite alert to being a bit more drowsy. So you can see that he's quite, he's got quite, he's doing using all his energy just to breathe. I'll just show you again. He's using all his energy just to breathe. So that you need to be able to recognize the, the clinical signs of severe pneumonia and uh, and be able to manage patients uh, appropriately. This was this boy's chest x-ray. You can see this dense consolidation of both lung fields. And he's also got some element of heart failure. And the heart failure was because of his pneumonia. Sometimes, as you know, we see uh, heart failure secondary to pneumonia. And this boy also had severe anemia. So he had a complex combination of, of several things. I'll just show you a different child. The first child I showed you had severe pneumonia, but I want you to tell me what you think this baby has. This looks, this baby looks a bit different. And I put a microphone up to the baby's, uh, uh, close to the baby's face, so you can actually hear the way the baby's breathing. I hope you can hear this. So what did you hear? It's in some ways it's important to uh, th tell me what you saw and what you he heard. Does anyone want to have a go? Okay, well, I think uh, I hope you were able to hear what I um, uh, this that baby breathing because I, what I wanted you to listen for is what phase of breathing could you hear that what he, what what that baby was doing was wheezing and maybe it was a bit little bit uh, uh, not quite as uh, clear because of the microphone but but that baby was wheezing and that sometimes you hear an audible wheeze when you see a child who's got severe airway obstruction and severe bronchiolitis and that was the audible wheeze that you can hear sometimes from a baby who's got severe bronchiolitis and what I wanted you to see of course there was that the child had chest in drawing but also had hyperinflation of the lung that is the the whole chest was like a barrel shape and there was but I wanted you to to see the hyperinflation and the chest in drawing and I wanted you to be able to to be able to hear what phase of breathing the child was making the noise. And the, that's important because if the, if the uh, noise is being made when the baby's breathing in, then it's different. It's a different cause to when the noise is being made when the baby's breathing out. And I hope you could detect that the baby was breathing out when you could hear the noise. The wheeze was when the baby was breathing out. I'll just show you one more time. See that the noise is when the baby's breathing out. Yeah. And so you can see there the noise is when the baby's breathing out. And that when when you see that, that's when there's a prolonged 
expiratory phase to the breathing. You can tell that the baby's taking a longer time to breathe out. And that's usually because there's obstruction um, to the baby's breathing. And this is typical of bronch acute severe bronchiolitis. So um, we've looked at a child who's got pneumonia and usually the noise they make is usually not this wheezing. They, if they're going to make a noise, they usually make a noise that sounds a bit like this. And the reason they make that sort of noise is they're trying to exhale through a closed glottis. They're trying to give themselves some, some peep or some extra um, expansion to the lungs as they breathe out. That's pneumonia, whereas this is bronchiolitis and it sounds a bit different. It doesn't matter that much that you, whether you can make a distinction in all children, but just to know what the clinical signs are that make it are a little bit different. When you look at this x-ray, this was the x-ray of the baby I've just shown you who had the expiratory wheeze. And what you can see is that the, the lung fields are quite large. They're not, they're not small lung fields with consolidation like you usually see with pneumonia. They're quite large hyperinflated lung fields like you see in babies who've got bronchiolitis. So bronchiolitis is caused by the viruses, those viruses I mentioned at the start. So RSV, parainfluenza, adenovirus particularly, um, and, uh, and th those, those and, and some other viruses. Usually it's self-limiting, like the babies just get better, even if you don't treat them with antibiotics, they usually get worse for the first two or three days and by day four they're starting to improve now sometimes they can have a more prolonged course if they've been if they're unwell for some other reason it's usually self-limiting as in even if they don't get antibiotics they get better with bronchiolitis but sometimes it can be severe and sometimes it can be associated with like a secondary bacterial infection like i mentioned infants with bronchiolitis they're usually quite well looking they've they've got fast breathing but they you know, often look quite quite happy and comfortable, unlike that baby I showed you who had severe bronchiolitis. They do have chest hyperinflation and they have this prolonged expiratory phase to their breathing. You know, normally when we breathe in, our breathing in takes a bit longer than our breathing out. But when you've got bronchiolitis, your breathing out takes longer than your breathing in. They often have wheeze, like we heard, and they often also have crackles. When you listen with a stethoscope, you often hear crackles. And sometimes when people think, oh, if you're hearing crackles, that must be pneumonia. No, a lot of babies with bronchiolitis also have crackles. If babies with bronchiolitis are very young, like in newborn babies in the first month of life, then sometimes they also have apnea. They'll have periods where they just stop breathing. That can be very dangerous, of course. It can be very dangerous because they might stop breathing for you know, 10 seconds or uh, even longer, and they'll need some stimulation to start them breathing again. But apnea and RSV are relatively common combination. As I said, bronchiolitis usually gets worse for one to three days, then improves over day four to seven. But there are exceptions, and particularly those they're, where they have some underlying risk factors for pneumonia or they have secondary bacterial infection. If you see a baby with bronchiolitis and they've got a high and persistent fever, like you know, well into day four or five or day seven, then that you've got to think that might not just might just not be bronchiolitis. Most babies with bronchiolitis, they might have a high fever to start with, but it usually goes, gets better within a couple of days. And so I always think that if you've got a, temp a baby with a temperature above about 38.5 or definitely above 39 for several days, it's not just because of bronchiolitis, okay? We've talked before about the stages of management of every sick child. And this also applies, of course, to children who have pneumonia. And so they are, just to emphasize again, triage, of all children, so assessing whether or not they've got emergency signs or priority signs, giving some emergency treatments such as oxygen or, or uh, IV fluids or whatever they need, taking a history and doing an examination. You should always do that in detail because you can learn a lot about their 
whether the child has risk factors make, makes them a higher risk. Um, this is important in the deciding whether the child should be admitted or go home, whether they should be admitted to intensive care or just a ward. You do any laboratory investigations that are required. So sometimes these children will need an X-ray. You think of their main diagnosis and the possibility that they've got some other underlying diagnosis like a chronic illness or anemia or malnutrition. You give them the treatment they need, the supportive care they need, monitoring, which we talked about a lot about last week, but we'll go over again, then discharge planning and follow-up. That all applies to children who've got pneumonia or severe bronchiolitis. You have to go through all of those stages for these children. I just wanted to show you a um, two videos that I think are really instructive. And this was a small baby who had pneumonia. Just, oh, it doesn't show up very well. You have to turn your turn side on. Sorry, I don't know what happened there. You can see what's happening to the oxygen saturation, I hope. This baby's got severe desaturation, a saturation of like 51 there, 49, it's going down and down. And this, this, the next video is just a minute later, one minute later. This one might turn side on too, but watch the oxygen saturation. Whoops, oh no, let me just see if I can. Oh, it's gone side on, but you can see this is one minute later and the oxygen saturation is 98%. So it went from 50 to 98% within a minute. And uh, the important thing is you can see the only thing that's been done is that the babies had been given oxygen. And the, the amount of oxygen going was somewhere just less than one litre per minute. It was only about a litre per minute to give this baby and sometimes people think, oh, if you've got an oxygen saturation of 49%, then the child will need some more heavy intervention. They might need to be on a ventilator or something. No, they may do, but most of these children, the majority of children will just get better if you just give them oxygen. And it's surprising how much you can improve severe oxygen saturation. And you can see this baby here. I mean, the, the baby in the, fir the first video was very sleepy to begin with because she was severely hypoxic and then give her oxygen and she becomes alert right and so i just want to emphasize just how important it is to give oxygen to these children when when they need it in fact if you look at this is I'll, i won't go into this in too much detail but this was um a thousand children a thousand one hundred and sixty children who had severe pneumonia and this is their oxygen level and this is their risk of risk of dying. And when they came into hospital, if their oxygen level was less than 85%, they had about a 5% risk of dying. But if it was even lower than that, like 60%, it was about 7% risk of dying. If it was 40%, they had a 10% risk of dying. If it was 20%, they had a 20% risk of dying. But you can see that for most of these children, they got better if you just gave them oxygen. And so th this is uh, an important, important lesson that sometimes we think that the intervention has to be very complicated. No, sometimes it's just giving oxygen, giving antibiotics, and, and most of these children will get better. I won't go into this too much, but this tells you just how long you have to give oxygen for in some children. And for some children, the amount of days, the number of days you have to give oxygen for is quite long, even sometimes longer than 10 days or even 20 days, about 5% of children needed oxygen for longer than 20 days. And, and uh, this is in the highlands where children are more likely to be hypoxic. So oxygen is very important for these children. You just need to, need to know that. Sometimes we see children's wards that are full up with children needing oxygen. These are all babies in Kainantu Hospital that needed oxygen when there's an outbreak of bronchiolitis or an outbreak of, of pneumonia. Um, and that's fairly seasonal, but it's important that we have enough oxygen to give these, these children. I, I won't go into this in too much detail, but 
Like we, as you know, we looked at this in a very large number of children, over 18,000, nearly 19,000 children. And, and if you give oxygen to children with pneumonia, you can, you can halve the, the, the death rate from uh, severe pneumonia in, in children. Uh, and that's over nearly 19,000 children, halve the death rate if you have good supplies of oxygen, and you have pulse oximetry to do to do uh, to check their oxygen saturations. We talked last week about monitoring and response charts. I think there's a few key things when you're managing children with pneumonia. You have to have oxygen. You have to have pulse oximetry, and you have to have monitoring charts that tell you if a child's getting better or getting worse. Now, last week we gave an example where a child was getting worse. Uh, that was important, wasn't it? Uh, you needed to detect the deteriorating patient. In this, in this case, this was a child with pneumonia who's probably looking at the chart, probably getting better. So the respiratory rate was high to begin with and then came down into the safe zone. The, the oxygen saturation was low to begin with and then came up into the safe zone, right? Out of the amber zone, the orange zone, into the white zone, which is the safe zone. The degree of respiratory distress came down into the safe zone. The heart rate also came down. This is over the first uh, uh, day. And the other things sort of stayed uh, the same. The baby remained alert. So using a monitoring and response chart, you can detect when a child is deteriorating or improving. And this is very important. I mentioned at the start, we as pediatricians and pediatricians, Nurses, we need to be really good at assessing risk in patients. And we need to do that because we need to decide whether a child's good enough to go home or they have to be admitted, whether they need um, more intensive therapy, more oxygen to go to a, you know, a high dependency area, an ICU area to be monitored more closely or whatever. So we need, we need a way of assessing risk. And when you look at the, the biggest risks for children with pneumonia, their, the severity of their hypoxemia. If they have a high and persistent fever, like a temperature of 39 or more, if they have emergency signs, if they have severe malnutrition, or they have severe anemia, or they're young infants like neonates, they're at higher risk. Or if they have some chronic comorbidity like, like uh, cerebral palsy or HIV, they're at must, a much higher risk. And if they have some major changes on their chest X-ray, like they've got a miliary pattern or they've got an effusion or they've got an abscess or they've got, you know, dense consolidation or a whiteout of one side. And I think if we keep in mind these, these risk factors for severe pneumonia, then we won't treat all children with pneumonia the same. We'll be able to identify those small number of children that are most likely to die and be able to do something different about them. I won't go into this. I wanted to just briefly talk about a, a case study of a child who initially was thought just to have a virus, so a viral pneumonia or a viral bronchiolitis. He was a three-year-old boy. His name was Kia. He was a three-year-old boy. He'd had six days of runny nose and cough, but a high fever, six days of a high fever. So already there's a flag that tells you something's wrong. He was seen by the general practitioner and the GP thought he just had a virus, most likely just a virus. He was otherwise seemingly okay, but he had a cough, persistent cough, a high fever. And then he had one day of, then he was quite lethargic and fast breathing and difficult breathing, wasn't himself at all. And this was his chest X-ray. I want you to tell me what you see on his chest X-ray. Can someone tell me what they think they see? Well, I hope you can see that I'll just go through the normal things. His left lung looks quite normal, doesn't it? You can see all the air getting in. So that's nicely aerated. That's black. The heart's shadow looks normal too. And you can see that left hemidiaphragm, right? This line is the left hemidiaphragm. So that looks clear. The heart's shadow looks clear. So the left side looks okay. On the right side, however, he's got, it's almost all white, isn't it? 
you see the difference in the sides. This has got lots of air going in because it's black. Everything air is black. See all around him, air is black. In the, inside the lung is black, apart from a few patchy changes. But the, but the right side is all white. You can't see the right heart border. You can't see the right hemidiaphragm. The, uh, the right lung is completely um, whited out, isn't it? Almost completely whited out. There's a little bit of aeration coming in here where you can see a bit of air there. So can anyone suggest what might, what might be wrong with, with uh, Kia? Well, yes, Tr Tracy. Yeah, what do you think? Mm, it's probably a pure addition of the right lung. Um, pure addition. Yeah, that's right. Most likely, Kia has a pneumonia with a pleural effusion, isn't he? He's got a complicated form of pneumonia. This is, and it's important to be able to identify complicated forms of pneumonia. And if you see a white out of the chest like this, where it's where it's very white, then it can only be one of four things. It could be consolidation, like there could be just dense consolidation. There could be a fusion, like a large effusion. It it could be. I'll just get. It could it could be a collapse of one lung, or it could be a mass. Now, um, Tracy has said that cor correctly, quite rightly, that this is a plural effusion. You can see some aeration. So there's some air getting into part of the lung, the upper zone of the lung, but there's a big effusion. There's a large amount of fluid there. And so he won't, this boy won't get better. Kia wouldn't have got better unless you do something about it. And so he had a high fever. He had tachycardia. His blood pressure was a bit low. He could communicate, but he was lethargic. So he was started on the standard sort of treatment oxygen. And because he had severe pneumonia and a complicated pneumonia, he was put on keftriaxone and flucloxacillin. You could start him equally on flucloxacillin and gentamicin or, or penicillin and gentamicin. They, they would be okay, either one. But... For him to get better, he needed to have the pleural effusion drain, like uh, Tracy said. Uh, he needed to have the pleural effusion drain. And you can see there a, a, a drain in his pleural space. And from that came 160 mils of thick pleural fluid, right? The white cell count on that fluid was 11,000, so very high. And most of those were neutrophils. So you'd expect that this represents a bacterial pneumonia, wouldn't you? If you've got a big pleural effusion like this, it's going to be a bacterial pneumonia or it's going to be tuberculosis. But in this case, of course, bacterial pneumonia is more common. And he had gram-positive cocci on the gram stain of the, bacteria, of, the, of the pleural fluid. And because of the risk of TB, he had a negative gene expert test on that fluid and, a, and his acid fast bacilli stain was negative. But so he had a complicated common form of bacterial pneumonia, just pneumococcal pneumonia, right? Streptococcus pneumonia, that's what he had. And uh, this was his ultrasound. Now, some of you won't be used to looking at ultrasounds, but it's important that we have a bit of a go at ultrasounds. This is his lung, right? This is on day one, his lung. And you can see just a little bit of, after the drain went in, a little bit of pleural fluid there. When you look a bit more closely into the lung itself, you can see this little area, which looks a bit different. This is the lung, and this is an area where it looks almost like a hole. Many of these children that have complicated pneumonia, where they have a pleural effusion and consolidation from bacterial pneumonia, will also have some small abscesses within their lung. And this boy had a small abscess. You can't drain an abscess within the lung. You can drain the fluid from around the lung, but you can't drain the abscess from the lung. So you have to hope that the antibiotics get into the abscess. And this was a couple of days later when he had 
recollected some fluid and you can see that the abscesses are a bit bigger. And so sometimes you need to continue to drain or put in a larger drain to drain more pus that's come out. And as you can see there, he's got quite a sizable abscess within the lung. Mostly these patients will get better, but they it's complicated pneumonia that may take several weeks, even up to six weeks to get better. They don't need antibiotics usually for all that time, but sometimes they'll need antibiotics for three weeks if they've got abscesses and a big pleural effusion, which is infected like this. Um, so sometimes pneumonia is... The, uh, what I was trying to really explain is the difference between simple pneumonia, the common type of pneumonia we see, and then complicated pneumonia where you get empyema or effusions or abscesses. And so when, when we think about pneumonia, the highest risk children, we need to assess them to see if they've got complicated pneumonia because usually complicated pneumonia won't get better unless you do something else like put in a drain. Now that's probably only, it's probably less than 10% of all cases of, of pneumonia. Most of them, 90% will get better with antibiotics and oxygen, but about 10% won't get better, but they're the ones that are the highest risk of dying or having um, some deterioration. So when, when people have looked at this, they've called this type of complicated pneumonia, necrotizing pneumonia. It doesn't matter whether you call it complicated or necrotizing, but these children get progressive pneumonia despite what we think is appropriate therapy, oxygen, antibiotics. And they're generally disproportionately sick. You, you look at all children with pneumonia, but these are the very sick ones. They have persistent fever and respiratory distress, and they have... Oh, excuse me. Oh, it's Trevor Duke's thing. Yes, Mahmoud, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, perfectly fine. Yeah. No, that's that's very good. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be out soon. I'm just finishing my lecture. Yeah, scratch it. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, so the, these children with complicated pneumonia, uh, look, they look disproportionately sick. They have a persistent or high fever. They have like worse respiratory distress. They have a chest X-ray that looks like th that may have some uh, abscess or um, uh, an empyema or a fusion. And that's our job to recognize these small number of children. They're only like six to nine percent of all children with hospitalized pneumonia, but it's important we recognize them because they are the sickest ones that we need to pay more attention to. The, uh, I won't go into this in too much detail, but um, when you look at the like a, a um a biopsy of the lung. If you could look at the histopathology of the lung, this is what a normal lung should look like. So the the alveoli, these are the alveoli, and they're they're full of air, all right. But this is what necrotizing pneumonia looks like. It's full of um, inflammatory cells and pus and that sort of thing. The, so um, normally we don't see this histopathological appearance, but it's um, it's quite a different picture. Normal lung and necrotizing pneumonia. Most of the, co the complicated or necrotizing pneumonias are due to the common pathogens. So streptococcus pneumonia, just the pneumococcus, the one we talked about at the start, or staph aureus. And then there are some other ones. Don't worry about the other ones, but mostly it's, it's streptococcus or it's staph aureus. So it, it makes sense if we see a child who's got complicated pneumonia to, to cover for these two bugs particularly. And, and keftriaxone and flucloxacillin will cover for these two. So if you see a child who's got an empyema or a pleural fusion, then think about covering for these two bugs, pneumococcus and staph aureus. Well, just hold yeah. on one minute. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh, Rebecca, yeah. Sorry? Sorry, if you're in the middle do, do you mind uh, uh, you'll be 10 minutes? Is that all right? Yeah, uh, but it'll be about 10. Can I call you? Yeah. Okay, Rebecca, thanks. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to show you this, um, this X-ray of a child who has a lung abscess. And just, just to show you, this, is, this shows consolidation of the left lung, but you can see there's an air fluid level within the left lung. And this is a, a lung abscess. 
And so again, the child has got a complicated pneumonia. Staph, uh, again, this one was due to Staph aureus. This is another air fluid level where there's a, within a, an air of consolidation, right? So if you see like an, a pocket of air within consolidation, then think that this child might have a lung abscess. And it's important because it then puts the child into that category of having complicated pneumonia. Right? Again, a lung abscess, this was the same child, a lateral film, an air fluid level. So we've talked about simple forms of pneumonia and bronchiolitis, and we've talked about um, the classification of pneumonia, severe, moderate, or mild. We've talked about the stages of management of every sick child, and we've talked about how that applies to children with pneumonia, and we've talked about how 90 plus percent of children with pneumonia get better with just standard treatment, with just oxygen and with antibiotics. But a small percentage, somewhat less than 10%, will have complicated pneumonia and it's our job to recognize those children. And so that's about the clinical aspects of pneumonia. And I just wanted to, at the end, this is my last slide, I just wanted to just talk about a comprehensive approach to pneumonia. Pneumonia is so common in PNG and uh, the Pacific that we need a comprehensive approach. And that is both prevention of pneumonia and also treatment of pneumonia. We've talked about treatment, all the uh, things we've talked about in terms of treatment, but for prevention, there are ways in which we can prevent pneumonia. And many of these things are already in place. So the vaccines that we give, the HIV vaccine or the, the PCV, the pneumococcal vaccine, but also the measles vaccine is a very important um, preventative for pneumonia because many children who have measles get pneumonia. The BCG vaccine prevents TB pneumonia. The pertussis vaccine prevents pertussis. And of course, now the COVID vaccine would prevent uh, COVID pneumonia. There are many things that can be done to prevent pneumonia. So better breastfeeding and better nutrition, that would help prevent pneumonia because one of the most common reasons why children get pneumonia in the, at least in the highlands, is that mothers, they wean their babies early and they give, they give um, uh, semi-solid feeds before the baby's got a coordinated swallow. So they're likely to aspirate a bit of their food. You know, if you start solid foods on a baby before four months, then they're going to aspirate some of their food and with, when they aspirate some of their food, they're going to get the mucus that's in their secretions down into their lungs, and then they'll get pneumonia. It's a common reason why children get, get uh, severe pneumonia in, in the highlands. Those children typically have are exposed to indoor air pollution as well. So if you've got a lot of smoke in the house and the baby's got early feeding and uh, you know early weaning and solid feeds and they aspirate the mucus that's in there, uh, nasopharynx into their lungs, they're also aspirating a bit of smoke and they're aspirating bacteria. And that's why pneumonia is so common in the highlands because children get colonized with pneumococcus and haemophilus early, they get viruses, they aspirate the viruses, they get fed too early and they're exposed to too much smoke and, and cold as well. So they get, they, they have uh, fires within the house. So there are things that we can do to prevent uh, pneumonia. Uh, especially in areas where pneumonia is very common. Hand washing is very important because you can reduce the, the spread of infections from one person to another. And then there are ways we can prevent HIV transmission, of course, and that reduces the risk of pneumonia. And then we can prevent neonatal pneumonia by, by clean deliveries and prevention of low birth weight. So I think there are things we can do to prevent pneumonia in neonates. But I, I think it's important that we, as well as the, the treatment aspects of pneumonia that we are experts in the underlying causes of pneumonia, especially in the areas where pneumonia is very common and, and what we should do about it in terms of um, nutrition and better housing, better heating for houses and that sort of thing. So, okay. That's all I wanted to say today. Um, uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have about pneumonia or uh, respiratory infection. Thanks everyone for, uh, for listening today.